working out of Bedford uh, through the Elliott system. Um, I've been a family doctor for, I figured out it was like 36 years now. So I've had a lot of varied experience. I actually started, my first job was uh, up northern New Hampshire um, in a rural area. And this film really brought that home to me in terms of the types of resources that you didn't have and how you were always scrambling. So um, hopefully, uh, I, I, I hope we, I, I don't know what you guys are thinking, but I'm, I'm certainly not here to interpret the film for you. I just <laughs> would like to maybe have a dialogue or, or whatever. Um, my name is Philip Baker. I'm one of the residents here in Concord. Uh, so I'm a family medicine physician. I have been for the last three years now. Um, and I'm interested in really rural care. So I've done work in the Arctic in Canada um, and interested in full spectrum care from um, pediatrics to maternity to geriatrics and just kind of covering the whole spectrum, um, which you really need in a rural area is being able to do everything. And as Dr. Ogo said, covering um, healthcare um, across all those spectrums and with limited resources becomes very difficult. Um, so managing that has been kind of how I've tried to focus my care going forward. So. Um, I'm Elisa Dresba. I'm not a clinician. Um, I am a bureaucrat, but um, actually I'm the director of the Office of Rural Health and Primary Care for the state of New Hampshire. Every single uh, state in the country has an Office of Rural Health. Uh, of varying sizes, and we have um, some things that the federal government would like us to do, um, and a little bit of money to do that with. And then our job really is to figure out how to be all things to all people in our state, but mostly to make sure that um, we are feeding all the information we can get from the states about what's going on on the ground up to the federal government in the hopes that they will do less harm when they put out policies and things like that or do funding, that they really understand that rural has to be at the table because rural is different. Um, it's better in some ways, very innovative, very flexible. There are amazing things going on around the country. Um, and that ECHO model actually just got introduced in New Hampshire two years ago. Um, and there are a lot of things that are really special that are going on here in this state. And that's great, but there are a lot of things that um, even at our own legislature that our legislators don't understand that you can't do things in rural the same way you do them in not really urban New Hampshire, I call it not rural. Um, and, um, and sometimes that voice is really, really important. And I can tell you that we never met, but you were at a hearing recently and you testified. And it was incredibly powerful for him to be there because it was a hearing about residents and medical students. And um, it wasn't a good bill, I can tell you that, because I'm off the clock. Um, and um, after he testified, the sponsor of the bill decided to kill the bill himself. That's how powerful it was. Wow. Thank you. Um, there's nothing like hearing from a recent medical student and resident about how important that residency experience is, and that we can't shortchange that to meet a need in rural, which actually ends up probably harming rural. Um, so that's what was powerful about that day. Um, so I, and my very, very small office, <laughs> um, are all the time here to answer questions, to help you apply for federal grants, to help you understand federal policy, to help you understand things that are happening on a um, state level, to help you create networks, and to even sit on those boards and help you put those networks together. Um, we focus a lot on recruitment and retention. We have those issues that you saw in the film here about continuing crisis of providers. It's not new. It might be a new concept to folks, but it's been going on for decades in this state in particular. And our job is to identify those areas and designate them federally so people can be eligible for resources. And also to, to I don't really get to advocate, but I educate about the importance of pipeline programs like you saw in the film. We have some of those things in New Hampshire, but not in a consistent way that is accessible for all kids who are interested. And we're really hoping to be able to fund the areas that do that work so that we really can grow our own supply of kids. We do a really nice job for attracting people to the state, but there's nothing like having people in these communities who understand the people and the resource scarcity and the culture. Um, especially here in New Hampshire, we have a, a special, unique culture to here. Um, and it's really important for people to understand that because then what happens is we don't have people who come for a year and leave. We have people who come and stay and they create a life and they create a generation behind them of people who supply our workforce and really care and love about the people. And so 
we try and do that <laughs> on a daily basis um, on behalf of the state. Um, I guess, well, we're open the floor to questions at any time, but um, I'm just wondering how much you guys related to the film and how much it's, even though that was in New Mexico, how much of these problems are right here in Concord and certainly in rural New Hampshire. My sense is it's the same here as, as anywhere, uh, pretty much. But could you speak to that and to the relationships you have with patients that are alcohol and drug addicted and how you form a bond with people like that that are so, they're in your waiting room, like she said, even though they're so uh, pejoratively cast. I think one of my favorite things, sorry, I can speak without a microphone, yeah. I used to do theater. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, oh, I didn't need, okay. Thank you. Okay, so I apologize. Um, so I, one of the things that really or struck me about the film was especially relating to pregnancy and pregnancy with opiate addiction. Um, so we are dealing with that more and more um, through our clinic and through our practice and to hear about the stigma that patients um, go through and what they feel um, and just the shame that they feel and to be able to have those people and to have that conversation with them about um, what the steps are, what the options are um, and truly work with them through that pregnancy and then how do we get people into treatment and into recovery um, afterwards is really, as, as they said in the film, it's very rewarding and that's really what um, you can see through, um, through these processes and through these patients. Um, and then you get a baby afterwards and get to work with them too, so um, always a plus. About, oh, it's almost been 10 years now that I um, started treating uh, uh, people with substance use disorder with uh, Suboxone in my practice. And it was a, sort of a lonely um, place to be because I was one of the few people that I knew of that was doing it. And uh, it's been a hard slog. Um, luckily, um, some people are starting to recognize the value of it and people are starting to wake up to the fact that we have four to 500 people every year in the last few years dying uh, in the state from uh, substance use disorder. Uh, uh, I, I'm ashamed to say that we still have a lot of physicians who are um, not cognizant or don't want to recognize the issue and kind of keep their heads in the sand, but I think that's slowly changing and it's um, been a, a real issue. Um, I've talked to a lot of people about it, and a lot of people don't want to take it up, but you know, you keep trying. Um, and I think this this film very much illustrates the fact that it's uh, a real problem. Um, it is not just rural New Mexico, it is inner city Manchester, it's throughout the state. Um, I, uh, there's not a single community, there are very few families that have not been affected by this who, who live in the state. Um, and it's a, it's a health care crisis that is going under um, funded and under um, uh, treated. So I don't want to go on a long tirade. <laughs> Can you talk about, though, about partnering with your patients and the relationship? I remember you coming to Grand Rounds at the Concord Hospital with your patients to present to the physicians about Suboxone and making it real that these are folks that are helped by that? Um, do yeah, they, that was do they stay? Are they still with you? Uh, actually, two of the three of them still, I, I don't know what happened to the third one, but um, two of the three of the people that I brought into the Grand Rounds, um, I still see as patients very regularly. Every four weeks we see them. And um, I think uh, it's one of the most grateful and uh, stimulating and interesting population of people that I, that I treat. Uh, it really has given my professional life a whole new perspective that I didn't have before. Um, uh, and I'm very grateful to them because I learned just as much from them as, uh, as hopefully they get from me. How about you, Phil? You've been here long enough to... Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah certainly I find um, working with patients 
and doing home visits. So BJ actually started a home visit program through our residency training program. And so now we go um, to people's homes and uh, spending time with people in their homes like they did in the video is very rewarding to see people and meet them where they're at versus where you may want them to be. Um, so being able to have that step in that process um, to understand their familial situation, where they're coming from, with their siblings, with their children, um, and then to identify what are the next steps? How do we get you the best care and the best treatment um, that you really need is really, really good to see and good to build those connections long term because when those finished patients come in at Christmas time um, and really recognize that, wow, like over this year I've made some really big leaps. Mm -hmm. Um, since I last saw, or since I first saw you, uh, that really lets you just see that how that relationship works. And as you were saying, being in rural areas, it's having that community or that relationship long term. Um, and they related a lot of that in the video. And I sincerely hope that that program is still is still working in New Mexico. Like Echo. Mm. Is your name Alyssa or Elisa? Elisa. Elisa. Sorry. Can, so you mentioned briefly the same problem of finding providers. How far north of Concord do you need to go to you get into that, and then you go all the way up to Canada with trouble finding primary care providers of different sorts? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's interesting is that I, I feel like a lot, and I've only lived in New Hampshire for 21 years, but I feel like a lot of people think rural happens above the notch, and if you look at... Uh, there's 47 definitions of rural on a federal level. Um, we have our own state version, one. Um, and if you look at a map, a lot more of the landmass of New Hampshire is rural um, than people really think about. So we see those issues in Keene. We see those issues in Plymouth. We see them, of course, all the way up in Colebrook, which is a, almost as far as you can get. Um, in fact, a lot of people there just cross the border into Canada, get their care and come back over. They pay cash and call it good. Um, but we also see those access issues in Manchester and Nashua. So basically any place where there are vulnerable populations who have very complicated medical conditions and very complicated lives, um, it's really hard to get people to care for those people um, because it really is, it's a calling in a different way and then it's an education that allows you to have the confidence to do that and then once you're in practice it's that support um, and we don't have all of those systems in place in this state for that smooth kind of transition. So when we talk about telehealth, for example, telehealth is a great thing for access for care, but it's also a huge workforce potential because it supports our workforce that's out there doing things. Um, the original ECHO model in New Mexico is actually based on providing care to patients so they didn't have to leave their communities in New Mexico and go see specialists that their primary care physicians could keep them and treat them there, and they would only have to go to a specialist if they absolutely needed to. And so they are able to manage these chronic conditions, and it's a nationally recognized model, and that's why it's spread. And so you'll see it here in New Hampshire, and one of the first very, very popular echoes that was offered was substance abuse treatment for pregnancy. And there are so many providers who want to do that work who needed that support, and so they get on there, and you've got specialists set up like in a hub, and then you've got all these spokes. I know we're talking hubs and spokes in the state a lot, but we have all these spokes that go out and anyone can sign in and it's peer to peer and you have some knowledge base and then you talk about case review and everybody learns about their own patients and other people's patients they can relate and practice and it strengthens capacity while um, increasing quality of care and ultimately increasing access. So it's sort of, that's one of the reasons that people love ECHO, <laughs> the idea of ECHO um, and why it's growing. So. There's a tremendous amount of potential, but I don't want to pretend like there's not, there's a lack of resources, I think, and understanding about this. There's so many models and innovative ways of providing care for people and building those relationships that are not paid for by the traditional way that we fund healthcare. And so you have a lot of people who are willing to do those pilots and really take a risk. And there are lots of people in the state who do that and collect the evidence and data and try and show that it makes a lot more sense you know, never mind that it makes people's lives better, but that it makes, makes a lot more sense financially to provide care in that way, and a lot of that has been happening um, in the past decade. Do you have any programs to encourage local youth to train in healthcare like the one you used to? So the state doesn't. 
Um, there is, I'm going to do a little quick commercial. There's a bill in front of the Senate right now. It's a huge workforce bill, but pieces of it include things like developing this pipeline. And there's a piece in there specifically to fund something called an area health education center. They also exist in every state. The expectation from the federal government is that the state supports them. In our state, we do not fund them on a state level to do specific pipeline work. The bill includes some money in there to be able to develop that work. Those things exist. There's a Dartmouth summer camp where people can go and do health careers training. There are different programs at different schools. There are a lot, there's a lot going on in rural health north um, where the kids have clubs and things like that. Um, but there's certainly more demand by kids to have those experiences than we actually have programs. So really on a state level, what we fund and do is sort of what I call the top of the pipeline. So we have programs where you're already out of school, you're already licensed, and you're looking for a job. And basically, I'm trying to convince you to come to New Hampshire as opposed to anywhere else, and preferably anyone in New England. We're very competitive. Um, and I help you pay back your student loans. Income tax free for a service commitment of three years as a minimum. And we do that program, and it's incredibly popular, and it's a very powerful tool, but it doesn't increase the ultimate supply. Um, and we're not, it's not helping us grow our own and own community. So we really need to bridge that gap between some of the pipeline stuff we're doing and really fill in some resources for kids who are, you know, going into school, maybe a scholarship program. And then once you're a provider and you can make that commitment, then we do the loan repayment and the things like that. I can think of the residency program. I think we graduated 120 residents in 20 years, and two of them work up in northern New Hampshire. That's, that's about it. Right. Yeah. The majority of our practicing providers in primary care um, did not um, actually train somewhere in New Hampshire. So if they can do a residency somewhere in New Hampshire, they're more rural physicians. But most of the primary care providers come from somewhere else, and they're, they're brought in by something, some connection to the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any questions from the audience? I just want to. Um, sure. So I'm in the workforce um, recruitment and development as well. And I'm going to run the mic up to you. So Thank you. Um, <laughs> you're my steps in. You're my steps in right here. You're going to be. So hi, I'm Michelle, and I work in workforce development and recruitment. I work for um, Bi State Primary Care Association. I work on, actually a lot with Elisa. So, um, Phil, I'm sort of interested to know you're a resident, you're saying you want rural, and that's kind of unusual, so um, what's attracting you to that? Like, when you think of the top three things that are pushing you in that direction, what are those things? Um, I think it's actually something that I struggle with personally because I think that we don't do good advertising for um, rural areas, and I think if there's a lot of... Um, things for new physicians, they hear about, oh, there's a rural area, oh, we'll just throw money at you. And walking past a booth in um, Minnesota, somebody just yelled out a number. Like, they didn't say anything about their place, like where they were in Minnesota, they just threw out a number. Your, your salary? Uh, yeah, they just said, they just, as I was walking by, 350000 I was like, well, I don't care about, like, <laughs> tell me about your community, tell me about the people who are there, tell me about... Um,